Hey guys, welcome to part two of questions about European instruments. I have a friend, Jen, who has a violin from the 1730s and another one from the 1890s. Although these instruments are fairly similar in size and shape, why do they sound completely different? That's definitely not the age. So what makes instruments sound different is their materials, so their timbers, their shape, and that's also shape of the F holes, and then the thickness of the plates and the thickness of the um, ribs and things like that. I work very carefully when I make my instruments to bring the top plate, the back plate, and the volume of the instrument into a a very careful harmony so that the instrument speaks very easily but yes the shape has a big influence but sometimes the timber as well especially the top plates that that are quite spongy and those instruments have a tendency to sound dull how has the glue changed over time are modern high glues the same as the ones in 1500s pretty much they haven't changed much at all but there's you know there's instruments made in the 1500s where the joints have actually held for close to 500 years so they work why change there are a lot of modern glues i i get it there are a lot of modern glues there's been a lot of advancements in glues but have they really been tried and tested over 100 years 200 years and they just haven't I'd rather go with something that I know will stick so that um, some people actually use a casein glue which uh, both these glues were used uh, casein and hide glue were both casein is made glues made from a milk product and they use it for the center join of the instrument and it's very very holds very firmly and it's also waterproof whereas the hide glue isn't waterproof the hide glue has been actually used since egyptian times and so yeah so has casein so they work why why use a synthetic glue like i know for example that the fiberglass products that are held together by a synthetic two-pack will you know start disintegrating from light and oxygen after 20 30 years so you know if i use those kinds of glues will they start falling apart after 30 40 years and i've seen that happen so i, I just stick you know, I know that the old glues work. I know they've worked for hundreds of years, so why change? And people say, oh, I'll go with the times. Yeah, look, if it works, I will. I went into an Apple shop once uh, with a three-year-old iPod. That was many years ago when there were still iPods. And uh, they said, look, this isn't really working anymore. And the guy said, oh, yes, no, no, we call this vintage. I said, I'm a violin maker. I work on antiques. And I would call this bad quality you know violins were made to last for hundreds of years not like a lot of modern products that are literally made to fall apart after one year so you can buy a new one i want to know what kind of early string material had the strength to withstand to being tuned to e guess what gut so gut strings were actually tuned to e believe it or not they broke quite regularly but that's what they use obviously the e was tuned a little bit lower because they tuned to 440 but still Plate thickness has been scrutinized in many diagrams how different luthiers approach this has been documented. So my question, how do these patterns change based on individual pieces of wood being worked on example? Do luthiers carve different based on grain pattern and density? Absolutely, you're right. So a more dense wood you can make a little bit thinner than a less dense wood. In the end, I tap tune my instrument so you can kind of hear it. Oh yes. So the next question, is tapping a proven method for plate tuning? I believe that all the really good old masters tap tuned their plates. How do you know if a top plate will be a good match for the bottom? Again, like because I tap tune the plates to each other, they usually will match very well. I'm just very careful to use a top plate that has a nice uh, ring to it. Here's a top plate that I got from the Fiema Valley, which is uh, the same valley where they think Stradivarius got his wood from. It's got a nice ring to it. Yeah, so that's quite exciting. I'm looking forward to turning that piece of wood into an instrument. It is currently only five years old, so I, I'm gonna leave that season for a 
few more years to a decade or so. What is the best type of wood for a violin and why? So spruce is very good for the top plate and maple, we use a lot of maple on the back. So the spruce looks very different. So this is the top is spruce and then maple has those beautiful flames. This is my Pietro Giorgiani violin. The timber on the top plate, you can see the grains quite clearly. So there's the dark grains and the light grains. So that's the most important thing for the sound of an instrument because the, uh, the dark grains are the winter grains, the light grains are the summer grains. So uh, the timber always grows a lot more in summer than it does in winter. And so that means that sideways, like sideways here, it's actually quite flexible. But lengthwise, because of the winter grains, it's actually quite firm. So instruments will vibrate very easily uh, sideways like this, but not so much lengthwise like this. And that's really important in the sound of an instrument. So you want nice, clear, fairly hard spruce with a nice, you know, clear winter grain. It's good to have them grown in the mountains because the winters are a little bit harsher. The summers can be a bit warmer and you want really nice, strong winter grain. Uh, and you also like when you tap the wood, you want to hear it really nice and clearly. Why do some luthiers say that sanding is bad for a violin? So you got like fibers of wood you know and they're all kind of sticking up if you cut through them they cut cleanly if if you sand them you basically the the fibers like you, you end up with like this fluffy kind of finish on, on top of the wood if if you looked on a microscopic level between a cut surface and a sanded surface, the cut surface would have very clean cuts through the fibers, whereas the sanded surface would, would um, have like, you know, would have been sanded and it would kind of have a spongy uh, finish or, or, or lots of little tiny fibers sticking up. And you can get around that by, um, you know, wetting the timber, sanding it again and doing that three or four times. But it's still, to violin makers, it's kind of cheating a little bit. Uh, so violins were made, I was just thinking about it, until the 1950s really, like like things like a circular saw were really expensive. So people just didn't buy them, even, even 60s I think. 70s uh, circular saws became affordable in the 1970s. So that's only like 40 to 50 years ago. Before that, everything was made exactly the way it was made, you know, like in the 1500s which is pretty amazing and so yeah so we prefer to cut and we use scrapers scraper is actually a cutting tool as well if it's nice and sharp so it just gives a cleaner finish and and then when you varnish the instrument you can look deeper into the instrument but you know like i was showing you before how you can look really deeply into the timber that's that's just beautiful so that's the kind of finish you're going for nowadays we use clams but could you show how luthiers use twine to tie down the blocks i think they use kind of pegs in the old days for for around the edges i'll see if i can find a picture of how it was done uh the closing clamps no they were not a new in invention they've been around for a while they used to use like uh quite big clamps at one point. This is an old timber clamp that I inherited from a violin uh, well that actually someone else bought off a violin shop and then they decided they didn't want it, want it anymore. So they were made from timber, the closing clamps. Whereas these days I obviously use uh, timber. I use timber and steel. But you can also get the really modern plastic clamps like these ones here. But uh, I do have to say that uh, I had to replace these. Like the plastic actually disintegrates after... Uh, probably about 20 years or something like that and it just cracks and falls apart. My timber clamps that I made in 1986 still serve me really well and I think they will continue to serve me for the rest of my life. So that's these are my timber clamps. I made them in, yeah, like I said, 1986. So that makes them 37 years old or something like that. And they work well. All right, what coffee maker do I use? Okay, I use a Breville to make my espresso and I use an Aeropress when I'm traveling. Look it up, Aeropress, it's kind of cool. It makes a really yummy coffee and it's small and easy to transport.
Do they use the same some wood treatments in the old time? How do you think about wood treatment? Is it good for the sound? I don't think that the varnish and the wood treatment has as much effect on the tone as some people like to talk about and think. There's a lot of researchers that put all their effort into, into that and they say that Stradivarius used boron in his wood and um, I think they may have used borax to prevent um, uh, woodworm and other animals from getting into the wood. Uh, then they found traces of various other things but I don't actually think you know, if you've got a good, decent varnish, what's more important is that the plates are nicely tuned to each other, and that includes with the varnish, not without the varnish, and that the instrument just works very well and has a harmonious shape. That's more important than some of the old time treatments. How to differentiate, here we go again, 1880s to 1950s German and French and Italian violins. Are there any workshops that are good price value? You can get some really nice um, mass-produced German and French instruments from uh, the French one from the Mirkor area, the German ones from the uh, Falkland area, but it's sort of a maybe a one in ten kind of thing. So you you will get some good ones and you'll get some not so good ones. So you really just got to look at a whole lot of instrument. But the old German instruments, uh, quite often you can get some really good value. The French ones seem to often have a, a bit deeper sound, um, you know, a, a bit richer, but they don't carry quite as much. But then some German instruments are so badly made, uh, they made some really cheap ones where they just carved the inside so roughly and just didn't bother finishing, finishing them because they thought no one was going to look anyway. And... Uh, the wholesalers were really used the uh, the cheap violin makers um, and paid them hardly anything for a violin. But you can get some really, you can also, there were some workshops in that area that made some amazing instruments. It's just worth looking around. You can get some really good value. Italian instruments, they vary so much. You know, you get some amazing makers, you get some very average makers. Italian instruments tend to be a bit higher in price just because they are Italian instruments. I heard someone say that the old violins had shorter necks compared to today's violin. That's true. Exactly. It is true they were a lot shorter and actually the kind of shape, this is a Baroque violin and it has that shorter neck and it kind of uh, has a bit of a different shape as well. I would like to know if there has something actually happened on the last hundred years. I feel that every luthier does exactly what people did a hundred years ago. No, we've got electric tools now, that makes things a lot faster. And then also there is a lot of technology that some makers, especially in America, use for tuning plates and things like that. I don't use that technology. I've been using tap tuning and, and adjusting the shape for an optimal sound for years and it just works beautifully. I don't feel like I need to change that because the instruments sound really good so why change something so we'll use uh yeah we can use a lot more machinery that speeds things up some people even use uh, um, like cnc machines you've got to be very careful with that because each piece of wood is different and has to be treated differently so if you make plates that look exactly that that are exactly the same they're going to sound very different why have other body designs like viola de mora viola de gumba died out while the body shape as we know it today has survived. Very interesting. It's the Darwin thing, survival of the fittest. <laughs> no, it's, it's actually um, the violin family has such a good projection, sound projection, that it's just become the most popular instrument. So obviously there's still makers, uh, there's still players that, that play early musical instruments. Uh, there's some beautiful groups that do some really amazing stuff, but quite often if they want to play in a large hall They might have to do some amplification. Those instruments were not built for a large hall Those instruments were built for small chamber rooms. Next week. I'm testing a 7 8 Jérôme Thibouville Lamy violin. Thibouville Lamy was quite a large company in France I can't really say much about them because they are very different. So JTL had uh, a lot of um, trademark labels. Uh, also, the, um, 
Charles Boutot was one of the guys that uh, set it up. They've got Barnabetti, Breton, Boutot, Le Parisien, Salvatore, Salsa, Thierry, Bertolini. So they had lots and lots of different labels and different qualities of instruments. Yeah, JTL instruments, you can't just... Uh, so that's Thibouville Lamy Company, Jérôme Thibouville Lamy Company. Uh, it's a French company formed in the mid 1800s and it was basically a merger of a whole bunch of makers uh, that wanted to work together to kind of propel their name forward and the name of French violin making. Why are there so few old European violins in circulation nowadays? I don't think there are so few, there's quite a lot. You know, there's, I mean, the cheaper instruments, uh, there's a lot of Chinese instruments, but I think there's actually quite a lot of old uh, European instruments in circulation. It depends what country uh, you live in, too. I know in Asia it's a lot harder to get old European instruments, and they're often overpriced. Okay, so the final question. Why is everyone always making such a big deal over ancient varnishes? Is it really that much better than modern solutions? So, yes and no. What I love about ancient varnishes is that they last for a really long time. I know that the old oil varnishes, as well as the old um, the old spirit varnishes, are going to last, you know, 100, 200, 300 years. I've seen it. The synthetic varnishes, I have seen instruments with synthetic varnishes where the varnish has flaked off after 20 or 30 years. So I will always choose a natural varnish and over the top of a synthetic varnish. Uh, I do a lot of experimentation. So the really old varnishes were the... Uh, oil varnishes and then uh, they started getting shellac based varnishes. Uh, I've worked with both. Oil var varnishes are not as uh, durable as some um, spirit varnishes. They can be a bit softer. They're, they're very beautiful. Like they have a really deep shine. I know makers that use a type of spirit varnish that acts like an oil varnish. And that's really amazing. So it's something that my dad's been using for the last um, 50 years or something like that in violin making. And they, you know, we've, it, because he's been making instruments for so long, he started over 60 years ago. He, you know, he, he has instruments that are over 50, 55, close to 60 year, years old, and they're looking beautiful and working beautifully. So... I, I like the old traditional varnishes. Again, they've been proven, they work, so if, you know, if something works well, why change it? Um, you know, that's, I, I love, you know, I love the fact that these things have worked for so long. I know in modern times we like to change things all the time, but some things were really actually just work very well, and why change them? I'm just truly amazed that, you know, the, the violin family, which has been around for almost 500 years, so 470 years or so, but possibly more, that they have worked so well, they're so successful, they have this beautiful, clear, brilliant sound, and people aren't actually able to improve on it all that much. Uh, unless they go synthesized uh, and, and create changes to the sound that way. But it, it, it's a totally different sound. So I just love that about the violin family. And I love, I love being part of uh, still making these instruments very similarly to how they would have been made in Cremona in the mid-1500s. I mean, that is pretty cool if you think about it. You know, like how many professions do we know today that are still done the same way as they were over 450 years ago. Um, there's very few. Stringed instruments are just very beautiful and I love the sound. You know, there's just, they have a totally unique sound. 
Anyway, I hope this has given you some answers. Love your questions. Keep asking more questions. Keep playing. If, you, if you've been thinking about learning the violin, start learning. It is such a beautiful instrument. Or the viola, the cello, or the double bass. Double bass is a lot more expensive. Don't buy a crap instrument. If, you know, buy a decent instrument. Uh, I've got my seven essentials guide if you're looking for an instrument and if you can afford it You know spend just that little bit more if you're an adult player Don't buy that hundred two hundred dollar violin, you know, you're, you're better off buying something a bit better There are some really wonderful instruments out there But if you spend a little bit more you actually have an instrument you'll enjoy playing Anyway, keep making beautiful music. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye Thank you.